few minutes, Dr. Greg Salea, functional medicine specialist, and I are going to talk about SIBO and how it affects your health. Hi, I'm Mark Allen from Late Night Health, and we invite you to listen in as Dr. Greg Salea and I talk about this interesting, uh, I guess is it's a new situation, Dr. Salea? Hey, Mark, it's not a new, it's just we're starting to recognize it. And SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And it's a condition that can cause different symptoms like nausea, bloating, vomiting, diarrhea, malnutrition and weight loss, even joint pain, fatigue and rashes, acne, eczema, asthma, depression, rosacea, and th there's other symptoms as well. Wow. How, how would you know if you had SIBO? Do you have to have a test for that? Well, yeah, there, there are certain tests that you can have done. One of them is a breath test that tests hydrogen and methane gases. There's also stool testing that you can have done as well. Uh, I know that, um, I know with a breath, a breath test, for example, that people with diabetes have a certain odor. Uh, have you heard that? Yeah, those, those are ketones. It's a little bit different. But uh, SIBO is where your bacteria that usually reside in your large intestines start to creep up to your small intestines. And then we have a lot of issues occur because we don't usually have those amount and those types of bacteria in the small intestines. Got it. Are these generally considered good bacteria? I mean, you and I have discussed probiotics and prebiotics. Are these uh, similar to that? Are they, they good and they just overgrow? Yeah, it's what we call a dysbiosis. You can have everything from uh, beneficial bacteria, but pathological bacteria. You can have parasites. You can have a lot of different things, but mainly bacteria that have overgrown and they're in the intestinal, the small intestinal system. And which is different than, than bad pathogens, bad bacteria that, you know, for example, food poisoning, bacteria from food poisoning. Yeah, no, that's a little bit different, but we do have uh, opportunistic and pathological bacteria in our intestines. It's just a matter of the good ones keeping the bad ones at bay. So it, it makes a big difference on what you have as far as bacteria, sure. Interesting. What about uh, the testing? Uh, how do you, you, you come to you and you determine, you know, what kind of a test should be done? Yeah, of, of course, because there are certain conditions that can sound like SIBO, but maybe aren't SIBO. So you have to start with testing to really determine what it is. You know, and if, if you just guess, sometimes it's hard to deal with. So one of the tests that I really like for understanding bacteria is a, a DNA stool test, uh, because we want to make sure we understand what's going on. So for example, let's, let's say you go to a doc and he runs a culture. Right. Well, the thing you have to understand is that most bacteria in your intestinal system are anaerobic. They don't breathe oxygen. So if you try to get it and culture it, you're not going to be able to get the appropriate understanding as far as the ratios of the bacteria and what you have, because they don't grow. They won't culture. Even, so, even the, even the uh, good bacteria? Well, it depends, it depends if they're anaerobic or aerobic, meaning breathing oxygen or not breathing oxygen. If they don't breathe oxygen and you bring them out and you try to culture them, they're not going to grow. They, they're it. dead. So how do you, how does this particular DNA stool test, how does that determine uh, uh, the bacteria? Well, when the culture is taken out, so in other words, when you go to the bathroom, you, you take the culture or the, the sample and you put it in a substance that pretty much kills everything. So right then and there, it kills everything. And then we take the test and we send it to the lab and the lab will determine what DNA we've got. Uh, and therefore, you can understand everything that you have and the proper ratios as well. So it, it'll, it, the, the, the lab will see, okay, well, this is human. This is, uh, oh, they've got a parasite uh, DNA. This is a bacteria DNA. Exactly, exactly. And that's one test. There's other tests, like I mentioned, a breath test. 
that will test for hydrogen and methane gas. Uh, these bacteria wow. tend to, to push those things out, and that can account for some of the bloating that some of these patients experience. Well, if, 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 if you know, if I eat, if I consume too much broccoli, <laughs> and I don't mean to be gross about this, but you know, I do produce methane gas. And well, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, we put people on certain diets when they have this condition. Right. And there's many different foods to avoid. And one of them, by the way, is broccoli. Right. Even though we all know that it doesn't taste good. Some people like it. You like it. You like the taste of broccoli. Right. 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 Yeah. But just because you have, let's say, gas from broccoli doesn't necessarily mean you have SIBO uh, right. because it, it's, it can be in a different place. I see. I see. Uh, how common is SIBO? It's it's getting well. It's been out there for a long time. We're just being being able to understand it at this point. So you know, there's there's so many different reasons that this can occur from many diseases like diverticulitis, uh, uh, losis, uh, diabetes. Um, you have pancreatic issues. You have celiac disease. You have aging. You have diet. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. So that the the the, the symptoms can be are similar to others. But at the same time, we've kind of narrowed the niche and came up with 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 the specific uh, ailment, SIBO. Yeah, it's it's an, an issue that you know most doctors may not necessarily recognize at this point. Uh, it's usually one of those things where a patient comes in and you really most doctors can't find what's wrong because they may not understand the condition and do the right testing and not under not know that right testing exactly and you know SIBO can cause so many issues with malabsorption you have iron you have b12 calcium uh the big problem is a lot of the fat soluble vitamins and you can have osteoporosis and kidney stones and intestinal damage as a result and you mentioned also malnutrition so even though you may be eating healthy all organic non uh, you know basically a plant-based diet, a Mediterranean style diet, good fats in your diet, yet you're starving to death. I wouldn't say starving to death, but yeah, you can end up with different issues. Like I mentioned, the biggest one is fat soluble vitamin deficiency. So you have vitamin A, D, E, and K, and they are extremely important. And, and of course they're not, so they're not being absorbed. Correct, correct, because you don't have the, the proper bacteria and the proper ratios to digest the food. Um, who discovered this? Who came up with SIBO? You know, I don't know. I just, okay. It's just over time, you, you see the research. And it's, I, I'm not going to say it's new, but we're finally understanding more of it. Um, and the, the treatment can be be great for it. It depends. I mean, the biggest thing is diet. So when a patient comes in with this condition, I really have to understand, are they dealing with SIBO? Are they dealing with an autoimmune condition? Um, but I'll probably start somebody on an autoimmune protocol. I'll put them on a diet to avoid fructose and lactose, you know, the, the, uh, the sugar and dairy products, the right. fructans, which is the wheat, the garlic, the onions, the asparagus, artichokes, the broccoli. Um, the galactins, the legumes, Brussels sprouts, soy, uh, et cetera. So we'll reduce these foods to see how they do, and then we can start to add them back in. Most of those foods that you mentioned are actually part of the Mediterranean diet or uh, what many consider to be a healthful diet. Yeah, and the autoimmune protocol diet is a bit different. But, you know, there's a lot of herbs that can help too. In fact, some of the herbs have been shown to be far more advanced uh, for far more advantageous than uh, <clears throat> um, antibiotics even. Well, and let's talk about antibiotics. I, I suppose that there's always a reason for them. Well, of course, but, there's always a reason for them. But, you know, just even perhaps one of the reasons SIBO comes into existence is chronic antibiotic use. Interesting. I know that a lot of people, they have a cold, they run to the doctor and get an antibiotic, and most colds are viruses as I understand it. Yeah, and that's exactly it. I mean, I see it all the time. Uh, but you, you've got to be careful when you use antibiotic. It's, you know, you may be trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer and you understand that if you do that, you're going to have a lot of peripheral damage as well. 
And so you've got to be careful when you use antibiotic. There's there's far nicer ways to do it that don't destroy everything, like the, the different herbs, like oregano oil and berberine extract and wormwood oil or lemon balm oil. Um, we'll give patient HCL and enzymes and probiotics as well. Uh, organ uh, uh, you just mentioned it, the oil, um, oregano oil. That seems to be almost a, a panacea for everything. It's a very powerful uh, herbal extract. Uh oh, telephone, I think it's for you. Yeah, uh -oh. <laughs> let me turn this thing off, hopefully. It's all right. All right, well, they're turning it off. Yeah, um, yeah oregano oil is, is great. I mean, it's, it's not the cure-all for everything. And, you know, if, if somebody's just taking it prophylactically to take it, there's going to be a problem. Too much of anything is a bad thing. It's, and by the way, it is very powerful. I mean, at least in flavor. Oh, yeah. I, right. I don't know. If, you know, most of the time we're going to prescribe it by, by uh, pill form. But uh, there's plenty of times that I've taken it in water. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty nasty. It is. It is. I've taken it. I take it semi-regularly in orange juice because it, it, it masks the flavor. And just, you know, in a six ounce or four ounces of, of, of OJ, one or two drops of the stuff is more than enough. It's. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very but, good. you know, it, I, I wouldn't suggest taking it on a regular basis. But when you have an issue, it's. It, it's a great adjunct to some of these other herbs to help treat some of these conditions. Gotcha. Uh, let's talk about the, the diet uh, that somebody that you're putting somebody on if they have SIBO or an auto, what you call the autoimmune diet. Well, I mean, like I said, there's, there's certain things that are, are very well known to, to have, have an issue with SIBO and fructose is one of them. So a lot of these uh, high fructose corn syrups, or even even sometimes sugar, or the uh, fruit sugar from fruit itself, you have to make sure to try and limit this stuff because anything that can turn to sugar or is sugar can eat, feed these uh, bugs or create inflammation in your body as well. I was you you got to my next question, which was, is does SIBO cause cellular inflammation? Well, in the long run, it does, and it causes inflammation in the intestinal system, which can create intestinal permeability issues, meaning, I don't know if you heard of leaky gut. We should do another one of these on leaky gut. Yeah, that'd be great. But you can end up with other issues as well. Uh, in, in closing here, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, sugar for a, for a second. Cane sugar or... Um, I'm trying to think of another, uh, uh, I don't like the sevias and, and I don't like the flavor, the taste of it. Um, and, um, the, um, there's a, um, it, it's almost has a honey quality agave, uh, nectar, uh, it, it, you know, one week it's, it's low glycemic. The next week it's, it's high glycemic. Uh, and and just like sugar is sugar sugar cane sugar okay or not well you know you prefer not because we get so much of it in everything and one of the issues here with uh being or having an upset stomach you have sugar alcohols as well but SIBO tends to have a real problem with sugar alcohols so when i have somebody that's got an issue with you know the different uh, sugar alcohols um, in the back of my mind, I have to think, is it SIBO or is it not? It could be not, but, you know, it's like, for example, just had a patient not too long ago have a problem with uh, sugarless chewing gum. And, uh, you know, it, it's not uncommon to have that because of the sugar alcohol, but it could make me think, gee, maybe SIBO is a problem. And my understanding is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that sugar alcohols can't be digested by the human body, so they're just passed through. You get the flavor and no calorie. Well, I, I don't I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I mean, it's a sugar alcohol. Your body knows what to do with it. Um, and so, but it doesn't give you the same glycemic effect as would a normal sugar. Ah, uh, it. But uh, it can, I know that with me, 
it it passes qu pretty quickly through me and brings whatever is there with it. If right. you get my, it can cause diarrhea or sudden urges to uh, to go. Right, and it it's it's common. I don't know how common it is, but it is prevalent with certain populations. Uh, but it, just because you have a problem with sugar alcohol doesn't mean you have SIBO. It's just we're finding out that a lot of people that have SIBO have problem with sugar alcohol. So it's not inclusive of each other. Gotcha. I have a feeling that you have uh, written an article on SIBO. Uh, I think I have. I, you know, I've written so <laughs> many articles. I, I, you you kind of lose track. But yeah, I'm sure I have uh, articles on my website. Uh, Dr. Salea.com. Go to my blog and uh, take a look around. In fact, we just were redoing the website and all the blog articles are there, but the pictures uh, are lacking at this point. So we're working gotcha. on that. All right. So uh, go to drsalea, C E L A Y A dot com, or go to late night health dot com. We'll post that. And, you know, send me the articles. We'll post your articles up there too on, uh, on late night health dot com. So maybe next time we'll uh, we'll talk soon and we will talk uh, about uh, we'll find something to talk about, won't we? Well, let's talk about leaky gut because that kind of gives us the next segue here. It really does. That's, that's, yeah. a, that's a good thing. We'll find out about leaky gut syndrome. Well, I'm Mark Allen and uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, watching. We will see you next time.